Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Data Art series of webinars on trends, technology, and thought leadership. Today's webinar title, Automate to Regenerate, will focus on cost optimization technology and insights for travel companies. So please welcome our moderator, Focusrite founder, and serial board director, Mr. Philip Wolf. Good morning, good afternoon, and everyone to regenerate. It's an incredibly important topic in today's business climate. And we're fortunate to be joined today by three distinguished speakers who are experts on cost optimization and technology for travel, tourism, and hospitality companies. Jen Pierce, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your, what keeps you busy. Hi, thanks for having me here today. Um, I spend my time helping companies get more out of their technology investments uh, on the product management side. So really looking at how do we get better outcomes, how do we be more data driven in deciding what are we going to build and why. So it's on the sort of business side of what technology we're building. Uh, in a prior life, I for more than a decade led product management teams and technology for both uh, Apple Leisure Group and Expedia. And you were on the Expedia team? team at Microsoft with Rich Barton when it was born? I was. I was part of that team that spun out. Yep, I was number 92 there. Oh, that's cool. That, that could be another whole webinar. Ed Silver, tell us what you do in your busy life these days. Hi, Philip. Hey, everybody. Uh, I spend most of my time working at the intersection of technology uh, and product management. So working with companies to understand how to build better products and build technology strategies that map to those product roadmaps. I spent my last couple of years at Flight Center as a chief technology officer uh, over the corporate brands. Thanks, Ed. And you're heading the travel practice at Data Art. What keeps you busy? Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it says unable to start video, so I'll just start with voice. There we go. <laughs> with the the, uh, the 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 joys of Zoom. So, um, Greg Abbott, I get to lead the charge uh, for the travel and hospitality practice at Data Art, where we help companies design, build, and maintain custom software solutions. Um, before I turn it back over to you, Philip, I just want to thank Jen and Ed for their willingness to participate in the fun today, and thank you, Philip, and to the Data Art webinar team for putting this together. Looking forward to an engaging conversation. For me too. So let's kick things off with this interesting graphic screen. I'm curious what your perspective is on how, there's a lot here, how this is relevant to the travel industry. Ed? Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot on here, a lot going on with this one. Um, and I think my colleagues sort of hated this chart. But what stands out to me the most, what jumps out right away, uh, digital transformation, which I think everybody was working on prior to uh, COVID, and now everyone is simply forced to accelerate those efforts. So digital transformation um, in all of its areas, that jumps out. I think digitizing the customer experience, that's probably really critical. And then for me, I love recognition technology. Those are the three that jump out that if you're not working on now, um, you really ought to be. You agree with that, Jen? Uh, largely, yeah. Like when I look at this grid, you know, I have to say I had a moment really enjoying thinking around the Internet of Flying things. That was fun. But in reality, you know, everybody I know is facing that whatever digital transformation exercises they had underway previously um, either needed to accelerate or be completely rethought, given all the realities we're facing with COVID. And for me, the big thing is helping all of us get one click more tangible about what we mean. Digital transformation is such a broad topic and it can be so esoteric and really kind of pulling it down from the sky and being really concrete about specific actionable things that companies can do to help them as they face this sort of very, very uncertain future. Yeah, that's good. For me, it was a little bit like buzzword bingo when I first looked at the, uh, the slide and I think that's what Ed was, is, uh, was talking about. I, I, did did I, you ever win buzzword bingo? Or you just never. No. Maybe during web web 2.0, I used it a lot. 
So that that could be could be where I won. But I think what p pulled off the page was, uh, you know, we're data art. So data governance is something we preach and best practices in that area. But if you don't have that already in place now, it's probably too late. Uh, I agree with both Jen and Ed that uh, digital transformation, while uh, it started uh, for a lot of companies prior to COVID, we've seen a real acceleration and companies uh, need to to really get serious about what they're doing in the space. And if if they're not, they're they're going to be increasingly pressured yeah. uh, from the business side of existence. Picking up on that, Ed mentioned that, of course, all these things were or should have been underway before, but now it's imperative so some companies are doing that. Many companies are holding, you know, treading water and some companies are pulling back. So what do you say to those in the audience that would claim they intellect at it, but right now business is down, cost cutting is paramount, they got to keep certain things going. What would you say to those that are saying, no, we're not accelerating digital transformation efforts now? Yeah, I don't know if that's to me, Philip, but I'll, I'll answer it. I'd say um, that they probably would be making a mistake with the time that they have right now. Um, it's a unique time and they can take advantage of certain elements of it. Um, in particular, you can change a lot of things, make a lot of radical changes to both your platform, your middle, your middle tier, how your agents work, um, without impacting a large segment of your potential customers. And so if you've had this fear of kind of changing the tires of the engine while, you know, while you're flying, now you have the ability to, to make radical changes. Um, anything you've thought about where you said to yourself, well, we, we've sort of always done it that way, and that's, that's how we're going to continue doing it. Those are the areas where you should look really closely. Um, and then just on your, on your comment about... Um, you know, teams who have been downsized and there are not a lot of staff. Some of the things I think you can do in the digital transformation space, in particular around automation, can be done by anybody. Anybody who is repeating any task anywhere in their lives during the workday should be looking at, at ways to automate. Um, and I can give a couple of good examples. I want to hear from um, Jen and Greg. Yeah. So it's Jen not just Greg, all me, good. but. Yeah. Good idea. Good idea to put the brakes on now for digital transformation. Um, I don't think anyone's putting the brakes on if they don't feel forced to. So I think what so many are facing is that the people they would usually turn to for technology, and I know a bunch of my former colleagues are with us on this call today, right? And dialing in from home on furlough, but that's the people they would have turned to in those times are on furlough or in some cases have been permanently laid off. And so for yeah. some companies, I don't think anyone is putting pause on digital transformation um, simply out of uncertainty. I think a lot of times they're trying to face this new reality of what can they do with the folks they have? They're really rethinking what is their new future going to look like? Um, I do think it creates some opportunities, one, to revisit which, which in the list of digital transformation things are most acute to be addressed now and which new realities also show up. So yeah. a lot more about, a lot of people working from home is gonna be from a mighty long time and there's a whole bunch of things we do that don't work very well for people at home so some of the digital transformation is not just the same old list right of features that we're building before but new right. capabilities but, and then i'll echo greg, what Ed is saying about sorry go ahead no i was just gonna ask greg but if you hold back a little bit because you're losing key people and we have a smaller marketplace so people are vying for market share in a smaller marketplace and some companies are proceeding and some aren't what does that say about the companies that are otherwise self-justified about holding back a bit? Well, I mean, it, clearly it depends on what arc your business in, is in. If you've got uh, cash and you're able to uh, look at a longer term investment strategy with some of that cash and understand that this unique period of time where things have slowed down uh, for your technology business allows you to actually start to look at the plumbing that you never could get to before. Um, early on when the reactions to COVID were coming, some of the most common things that we heard from our customers were, how do we optimize our costs? Uh, and, and really those that had just on-prem suffered greatly, while those that were in the cloud, we could come in and run an audit and help them uh, remotely very quickly to scale up and address some of the needs. And, and that was kind of why we were you know, struggling to frame up this, the, the title of this webinar, because for 
you know, as you said, where the businesses are at right now, cost is in, in focus. But before that, there was a lot more to digital transformation than just cost optimization, uh, yeah. as, as everybody would recognize. So I think it's a, just a sign of the time. Yeah, sometimes all the fears and risks people associate with making a bold move during a scary time mm -hmm. often pale in comparison with not doing it anything that's the, that's the fulcrum and for some of the more painful changes now is the time right for some of the really changes that you have always known you had to make um, but we're dreading getting to and dragging your feet for many companies this is the time it'll actually cause less pain now as long as the economics pencil out so yeah, sure. it is an opportunity to really revisit the list and kind of go actually that thing that we always I mean the Greg's point that we were dreading now's yeah. the time to just do it and make it so uh, Ed, you had some examples? Yeah, I mean, uh, for me, uh, I want to, <laughs> is that Jen Sorry. or Ed? Either or. How about both? Good boy. One of the it's time. A it's, Ed, it's a go bad for it. Day. I'll follow. I, I started to talk about uh, anybody on the front line um, and automation in this, you know, grouping of digital transformation. So anybody, an agent, uh, customer service, no matter what your role is, anytime you're repeating an action, um, whether it's from your customer service system, maybe your Zendesk platform, maybe it's your project management platform, anytime you're repeating something over and over again, it's an opportunity to automate. Whether you um, take a look at the platform you've got, there are integrations um, for automation inside your platform, or take a look at a system like Zapier where plugins to just about any platform are really easy to automate on your own. And you should be testing that as a, as a frontline staff member, bring it to your management and show them what you can do. But anytime you're repeating an action, look for a way you can find to automate that. And I think to build on that, there's so many times where I think folks that are on the business side of technology or the business stakeholders who are sort of funding the technology don't appreciate, they might have in their mind that it takes vast armies of developers, like vast armies of engineers to do these kinds of things. And they really don't, right? In today's day and age, there's so much new technology that can be integrated that makes it so much easier to do workflow improvements, like what Ed's talking about. And also increasingly, um, you know, we can talk about the chat bots and the opportunities they bring uh, and so also managing platforms. Let's pick up on that. So you, I think you're talking about really organizationally it's not as demanding a theme. So in these times with smaller teams and a, an increased focus on doing new things, from an organizational perspective, what would you recommend about changing the way your, your IT teams are organized, reporting lines, processes? What are some of your big recommendations? I'll give one, um, which is, uh, you know, you used to have kind of two buckets of IT. There is, there's your general technology team and your infrastructure side, and, and then everybody else. And what I, and then occasionally people would talk about things like a shadow IT group had, had kind of built up in an organization. What I would say now is everybody across the board is now in technology. Everybody is part of the innovation group. Um, and everybody should be testing proof of concept ideas in terms of way to automate whatever it is is in their area. You shouldn't be afraid of, of breaking things and your technology leadership should be giving you the ability to be a part of that innovation team. If that's not happening in your organization, I think you're really missing a big component of what's possible today. I think you're, you're right on, Ed. Um, that and we've seen some really successful companies that have created kind of a, a center of excellence around automation and taken uh, people from very different business units and um, and and as you you said um, you know we're at this really interesting intersection where um, software um, combined with uh, cloud computing um, it really allows for lightweight systems like robotic process automation. Uh, to be uh, put in play. And we've seen um, the return on investment in, in uh, implementing some of these solutions five to one and even pay for themselves in the same year. So I think there's really, if you're, if your business, it, from a business standpoint, if you're not experimenting in that space, now's the time. And um, go ahead, Jen. 
Well, and especially, you know, we're all starting to think about as travel recovers. And for all of us, travel is going to recover at different times and at different paces. But for most of us, we have to figure out how are we going to be able to handle the, the uptick in traffic while our teams may not be, you know, we might not be able to ramp up our teams as quickly. And of course, being able to predict exactly when it's going to come back and how strong is, you know, anyone's guess. You, and so, you know how to do that? Whatever, we can end right. that webinar now. Can you just predict for everyone how things are going Oh, to yeah. Year? So um, I think that February 6th looks really good okay. for all of it. But I think that, um, you know, those opportunities really are there. And in the past, they just felt so out of grasp of so many companies. And the more, you know, I'll keep evangelizing, like, things that you thought required just armies of engineers just aren't true anymore. So even more on the you know, people hear the word machine learning and they immediately go, ugh, no, nope, that's beyond us. We're not a software company. We're not a technology company. We can't do that. And like, oh my gosh, yes, you can. There's tons of great use cases. And so many use cases, at the same time they're saving you money, they're making your customers happier because you're responding yeah, faster. Even, like even Domino's wins. pizza calls itself a tech company. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the irony is, is that with the furloughs, there's less staff and um, to the tools can actually make up for the difference until people can come back on. And then you actually have the synergies of the technology in place to be able to ramp up so much more quickly as things expand. Yes. I'll give a, I'll give a, uh, a use case, Philip, if it's okay. I mean, any time you have to fill in the same form, say you have a new customer comes on board, and each time a new customer comes on board, a staff member has to go and fill in a, a whole set of information or data about that new customer. It enters into a system and then moves over to your CRM RPA is fantastic for those types of repeatable activities. And you What's can do RPA? a test, RPA, What's robotic R robotic process automation, which is what we were talking about before. You can do a test RPA robot in 15 to 20 minutes. Anybody, no coding needed to simply fill in that form for you and then repeat that process over and over again. And, it sits and those right are the kind on of things of your, you should be testing. Your, it, it sits right on top of your current IT infrastructure. Um, it, it's not always the right uh, sort of uh, approach for the overall organization business process because uh, there, there are some weaknesses of RPA automation, uh, including machine learning. But uh, certainly, if you haven't started, it's a great place. As Ed said, it's super lightweight, super easy to deploy. And any of the top three, you know, Automation Anywhere, UiPath, or, or Blue Prism will, will get you uh, loads ahead quickly. Marcos, did I, you have a question from the audience? Yes, Philip. Thank you. Um, I think we have a we have a question right now. It's have you seen any great examples of companies pivoting in the last eight weeks to take advantage of changing customer B two B or B two C needs and priorities? Yes, uh, I have two examples, um, and uh, let's try these, and then whoever asked the question can say this is in line with what they're talking about. So COVID obviously changed the world as far as all of a sudden, my favorite example is um, a non-refundable hotel rate suddenly became refundable, right? <laughs> and that was an example of, um, you know, uh, if you look at the big guys, right? This is not sort of secret sauce here, but it's like, yeah. So for years, we never automated um, the cancellation and refunds of non-refundable rooms. That was just not something that uh, was done. Expedia got that done in days. All of a sudden, the self-service ability to refund your non-refundable room, boom, it was live. Brilliant. And then another good example, I think, is, um, you know, I'll play from my Apple Leisure um, group experience. And, um, you know, that team, they put in a really creative um, offer to folks, which is, hey, if you, if you rebook, they give you, uh, they give you credit, right? They give you more, I think it's 25% more bonus if you rebook instead of refund. And that, of course, also took you know, a really quick response for the technology, everything from the landing page to explain it to the travel agents and how it all worked, but all the way through the workflow to make it operational. Yeah, that's good, Jen. Yeah, I think um, uh, I was gonna say Viking Cruises, which is obviously not terribly busy uh, last week and this week, uh, launching Viking TV is a brilliant example of a pivot at these times where you have people not traveling and not cruising and overdosing on TV and movies. So I thought that was brilliant. Yep. Go ahead, Ed. No, I mean, the other one um, that's very similar to what Jim was talking about it, in the airline side for agencies is um, a simple name exchange. So you've got an exchange ticket. It used to be nearly impossible to 
um, take my ticket. And if Jim wanted to use my exchange ticket uh, to put her name on it, it was nearly impossible. Now that is easily automated. The airlines work yeah. fast and the agencies move quickly. And now my unused ticket can be used by anybody else in the organization. I thought that was pretty rapid pivot from something that was very yeah. hard to do previously for no I'll, good reason. I'll play devil's advocate. I, I had a lot of people complaining about the speed at which they were getting exchanged or refund refunded. And of course, everybody was pretty patient, but at 60 days, people were like, okay, I'm ready. And it was a sign that it was really so off everyone's radar. Uh, the queue for exchanging and refunding, it was massive. You couldn't get through to an yeah. airline. It's still really hard to get through an air, to an airline. And another powerful theme around this is a, a lot of these things that companies are finally implementing, you could argue they should have done a long, long time, time ago. And yeah. that's the reminds me of the Peter Drucker famous quote, and I'm passing, but uh, people think that the tragedy of a crisis is the crisis, and it's not. It's looking at the crisis with yesterday's logic. And there's some companies in the whole collection of stuff to that audience question that's going to give them competitive advantage in short order. I to would like to hear uh, yeah. another you, you, question. You go ahead. Yeah, there's a great question. Just to concatenate to that before we move on, and sorry to interrupt, but lots of great stuff about tools and processes like no code, low code, cloud, et cetera, related to digital transformation. But for a lot of these initiatives to be successful, you need to change the mindset of the people. Thoughts on how to get uh, best uh, your workforce really excited about uh, and bought into this uh, change? Hypnosis. Wow. No, I, 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 have, I, I have one idea and I hope organizations are trying things like this. Um, sometimes they're called uh, hackathons or innovation fests. And this seems like an unusual time to run that, but to run an innovation fest now, but with your frontline staff and your customer service staff leading the, the request for what should be innovated, and then having your technology team empower them to try to innovate that on their own, taking a couple of days, uh, half a day, and going through that process. Now is the time to really be pushing everyone to try new innovations, even on their own or helping them through that process. I talked about being able to set up a robot in 15 to 20 minutes. Let's show those staff how that's done. And then they take a customer pain point and they innovate right around it. And I think that's, this is the time to be doing things like that. Yeah, you're, you're, on, yeah, go ahead, Jen. Let me build on that for just a second. Cause I think you're absolutely right. And yet at most organizations that I work with, right? The minute, and I love me a hackathon, like love it. But um, everyone sort of goes, oh, those are the engineers, right? That's what does it. And so what I find is the evangelizing that has to happen with key folks around the different business functions um, th to help bring them up to speed on a little bit around the art of the possible, like some of the things we've been talking about here. Because once we sort of unlock and help them, and I find that the real life case studies, I reference them all the time. Like Microsoft posted one last month about um, Scandinavian Airlines and some things they did. And those real life examples somehow bring the concepts down out of like the buzzword bingo cloud, right? And down to the ground in a way that people can start to get their head around it and then they can do exactly what you're talking about, Ed. They can, they can sort of see the parallels to their own business. And yep. then I think that's when it's like, okay, now unleash them, you know, with enough folks who can handle the sort of basics of getting some of these things off the ground. Yep. Did SAS yeah. do yep. stuff to mention? Sorry, say that again? Did SAS do something good enough to mention? Um, yes. I mean, uh, let me pull it up to remind myself of the details, but, um, well, okay. Greg made his well, point, doing but that, yeah, right? it's good stuff. Yeah, I, w yeah. I was just going to say, so I, I think we're all on the same page that, uh, that painting a picture for people, we help our customers through proof of concept. So being able to represent to the business owners in a very short period of time, a couple of weeks, uh, running a proof of concept and then bringing results is the best way to answer the question most directly. Of course, it's a bit of a shameless plug because that's what we do, but that'll help uh, bring consensus to the stakeholders across the business. I was on a session yesterday to the audience question about how do you get people to think differently? And we were getting a lot of resistance and the moderator said, okay, I want everyone to take minutes and just think like an innovative mode of silence. And at first you could see people twitching, they were uncomfortable. <laughs> 
in three short minutes, it did more to change everyone's attitude and thinking about getting into create creative mode. It was uh, very effective. I'm gonna, I'm gonna use it for sure. So uh, while uh, Jen is looking there, some companies haven't completed or even started a cloud migration. How important would you say, relatively speaking, that initiative has become? Ed? Look, it's or, it's like it, it, I try to speak in analogies. Um, everybody loves antique cars. They're fun to drive. Uh, they're they're fancy. They work great um, for a little while. Um, but as soon as you've got to use it for every day, you want to look at long time optimization of fuel costs. You want all the fancy technology that a vehicle can get you like a Tesla or you, you drive a Tesla, you realize the gap. And if you're not leveraging the, all of the tool sets in cloud for your business and all of the things that come above cloud computing in terms of those softwares and tool sets, uh, you're really missing out on digital transformation at large. So if you yeah. haven't started and you need a, a plan or a path, there are lots of options out there and it is affordable to be able to start and I'll bring up the affordability because I know we have some varied opinion on whether cloud is truly affordable. But, uh, you know, Gartner preaches 16% savings by moving to the cloud. Um, others say the cloud is just a way to pay for services you don't use. So it's, there's, a, there's a good debate at hand there. Ed, what side of the debate do you tend to lean? I lean on the side of the cloud. Um, and I know Jen and I were, were debating this the other day. I, I think... Greg's right. There, there are savings to be had. And the other thing to, to talk about here, just in the automation side, is if you are already in the cloud, make sure you are really uh, looking closely at how much of that you've automated um, and make sure you're not overpaying for, ser for services. There are ways to optimize your cloud platform, optimize your storage and compression of your storage. So really look closely at what your cloud costs are today because there's opportunity in the, in there. Yep. Provisioning, deep provisioning. Yeah. Yeah. And let me build that, you know, so, cause I realize I tend to come across as like, I'm super, I'm pro cloud. My challenge whenever, um, as again, the person's often sitting on the business side of technology, whenever somebody tries to use it's in the cloud as a benefit statement, I always make them unpack, like, what do they mean about that? And hat to, to Carl Person who helped me upgrade my language around, you know, a lot of times with the cloud, we're talking about, is it infrastructure, is it a service? Is it software as a service? Is it a platform as a service? And the more that we can understand those types of nuances, it really helps us get clear. I'm always just really clear. It's like, we're joking about web 2.0, right? Which is, people used to use that as code for, it's just gonna be awesome. Like it's awesome because yeah. it's in the cloud. It's awesome because it's 2.0, you know, 2.0. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like what business benefit are you yeah. trying to get here? What needle are you trying to move? And then just make sure that the things you do line up for that. Um, we, yeah. you're, you're so right. We have a, a great case study where we had um, a, a large OTA move quickly to the cloud without thinking everything through. And um, they got themselves in quite a pickle with the costs that they were uh, uh, quickly realizing were well above what was budgeted. And, um, you know, we helped come in and optimize the solution and save them nearly 50% in terms of their, it went, you know, $2.6 yeah. million in hosting fees to 1.3 or something, 1.2. Yeah. We're going to wrap things up. I want you to think about a final thought, and that is you're attending today's webinar and you've been tasked to send a short summary to your uh, colleague. And if there's like one sentence that you would underline in that summary, what do you think it should be? All right, I'll go first. Um, you know, explore new tech, you know, technology capabilities um, to unlock business benefit and um, get, get versed in the art of the possible of these newer technologies that are coming online. Yes. So if you're not trying red. Ed? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would echo that sentiment, sentiment and also say it's, it's really hard to, to break things these days. So go ahead and do your own proof of concept if you are repeating a task or filling out a form or, or moving one thing from one place to another on a regular basis, go ahead and build your own test case. See if you can automate it on your own and then take it to your technology leader afterwards. Apologize later if you broke some rules, so but get out there and, and automate. Be less risk averse, Greg. 
Well, my fellow panelists have really nailed it. I would, I would just add, you know, intelligent automation should be explored um, full stop. No matter what. Ladies and gentlemen, Jen Pierce, Ed Silver, Greg Abbott, thank you all very much. Dear ladies and gentlemen, our prime goal is to keep creating amazing webinars for you. Please uh, help us continue getting better by sharing your thoughts with us in any form.